I recently made a 10x scale Lego mini kit. Today we're going to look at how that was done. So I'm starting with a blank empty sketch through all the test prints and the failures and everything else in between. So to start the planning phase, I wanted to break down the mini kit into separate pieces and it's Lego. So that's kind of trivial, uh, but I did give the pieces each letters to keep track of what I was modeling. Uh, the A, B, C, and D are the center white cylinder going down the middle. And then the base plates are broken into two halves like I'm indicating here. Uh, the studs, I labeled E and F, why they're different letters. Don't, don't ask me now, I was, I was at the time. G and H make up the lever. The uh, left side here, the top and bottom are actually the same on the outside. So I gave them the same letter I, and then the other side was J and K. Uh, they're, they're split down the middle. So with these, I knew what I had to model. I could just make sure I modeled all of the letters. And I did actually measure Lego pieces with calipers and compare them to values I found online. What it ends up being is that each Lego stud is a eight millimeter space, but Lego does give you 0.2 millimeter tolerance on all pieces. So two studs width would be 16 minus 0.2 for 15.8. Four studs would be 32 minus 0.2 for 31.8. And that gave me all the dimensions I needed to pretty much start at this point. So we're starting with a brand new sketch in Fusion 360, which is a parametric modeling program. What that means is that it's all calculated with equations, and that's opposed to a vertex-based modeling. So here I'm inputting the size of the rectangle and circle. We can extrude those outward to get the basic uh, Lego shape. Uh, and be, since it's parametric, if I were to go back in and change those sizes, it would propagate through the rest of the model. So changing things that you did earlier is really easy when you model it like this. So I input the numbers I measured earlier for the top. For the bottom, all we have to do is create lines that are tangent to the top pegs. And if you ever change the size of the top pegs, that'll be adjusted. And this will ensure that the pieces will fit together because those will be next to each other. When I was modeling it, I also found out something really interesting about Lego. Um, the peg position doesn't form a perfect circle, so they go slightly over the edge, as you can see here. Uh, which, if you actually look at a Lego piece, is true. It's just kind of funny finding it out this way. Now, for the modeling of weird, complex shapes, I actually just went to the Lego website and got their pictures of the pieces, and then went into paint and measured the pixel lengths of the pieces, and did some math to convert them to millimeters. It's a weird way of doing it, but it actually works surprisingly well. And it was pretty easy, just a little bit of math. And I was able to get top-down views and side views, do all the math for it. And it, the pieces were the right size, so I can't complain about the method. It's just a little, little, little janky method. So from here, it was just a matter of modeling out all those pieces that I assigned letters to earlier. I wasn't so worried yet about the wiring. I was just concerned about getting them done because I didn't really have an exact plan for the wiring. I knew what had to be done in general, but not exactly how I was going to do it. And, you know, later I'll, later I'll figure that out. We'll get everything squeezed inside. For right now, let's just, let's just make it look like the thing it's supposed to look like and we'll get it functional eventually. But hey, now it's time to figure out the wiring. So when I'm doing the modeling, I don't have the best idea of perspective. Like I have numbers that show the size, but I don't really have a visual of what that's gonna end up looking like. So I actually took this paper and a nice uh, square edge here and drew out how big the base was gonna be. That way I could figure out how to fit things inside. Cause I had the physical Raspberry Pi. I could just place it in there and see where it would fit. So I drew the outside walls, I drew the inside walls, so I knew my spacing, and figure out where I can put the pie to make it all work with an actual physical representation. 
now we can hear what I had to say about it at the time. This is what's going to house most of the electronics. Electronics being essentially this Raspberry Pi. We have the outer walls on the outside. We have the inner walls that we can work with. These are constrained by the fact that pegs need to come up through this plate. And the things you have to worry about, we need to get a wire from here under the plate. We need to get a wire out to the stud on the edge of that little piece. We need to get a wire to go up. And we also need the power to come in from the outside via this USB-C plug that'll come in through a square hole on the faceplate. It's right along this. It's essentially going to have to be flush with the center line. Yeah, so if I put this here, take this coming in, cut its power, split it out four ways, one way into the Pi, the other way is the three cables. This ground can go that way too. The three directions will come off three of these pins. This could work. This could work. Let's just mark this down, take some measurements of where it can go. There we go. That's where it'll end up going. And to make sure it'll actually fit there, I did print out a test piece where I added some standoffs to the base and the walls just to make sure everything would actually fit as I randomly sketched it. So I'm tapping some holes to put the screws in. Now we're just going to use four screws to attach the pie here and make sure it all fits. The screws are going to go through to the bottom, but uh, whatever. And then a test piece to attach the USB port to make sure it clips into place real nice like that and doesn't wiggle around or anything. And it seemed to work fine. You can plug in, you can unplug pretty easy. So USB port is success and the Pi nice and close to the edge, a little bit of wiggle room. And on the bottom, the standoffs are just the right height to keep it off of the plastic base. So my filament choice for this project is gonna be Polymakers Polyterra. It's a cheap filament. It gives this um, matte finish instead of a glossy finish, as you can see here, like most other filaments. And I had it around, so I figured we're gonna use it. White, black, and gray, it's all we need. And with that, we can start printing. It's that easy. Right? Yeah. Nothing will possibly go wrong. It'll be great. No issues here. So I come back in after a long day of work expecting to find a nice completed print. Nope. Ah, uh, it failed like six times. Every one of those shifts is another fail. And it kept going. But definitely did not work. So diagnosing printers is not as easy as it seems. Uh, I've had issues like this coming up before where it was doing a lot of skipping and I figured the belts were too tight. So I've been loosening them and that seemed to make the problem worse. So clearly the issue must then be that the belts are too loose. So this printer does have the ability to adjust your belt tightening. For the Y axis, which moves the plate forward and backward, you can tighten this one screw which will bring the two ends of the belt closer together. Like you can see I'm doing here. Those two screws are getting real close now. And that'll tighten the belt uh, to the point where it's, it's really tight and you can pluck it like this. So here's a comparison of the before and after. Much tighter. For the x-axis, it's a little bit harder. So it also has, see it's really loose. It also has the ability to, to tighten the belts by taking this motor and rotating it using this top screw, which will push the top left screw further away, rotating the motor further away and stretching and pulling on the belt to make it tighter. But as you can see, that top left screw is already as far to the left as it can go. So tighten it as far as you can in that axis. So the next way to tighten it would be to actually adjust how the belt is attached to the extruder end. To do that, you have to take off this back plate, which covers everything. Uh, not going to take it off all the way, though, because all of the cables that go into the extruder go through this. And I'd have to take out all the cables to take it off all the way. So we're just going to kind of 
loosen it as much as possible and then pull it back out of the way and hope we can we can get in there and do what we need to do. So you can see now that we're inside, the belts kind of go across these little folds to hold it in place. Uh, so what you can do is you can pull it out of there and then just move it back in one tooth further down to make the belt tighter. Just like that. You can see now, now it's nice and pluck tight. And just like that, we're getting solid completed prints again. So now you get this weird piece, which you probably don't remember seeing on the list of pieces that needed to be printed. Uh, well, that's because if you take a look here at piece D on the bottom, 3D printers like to print on a flat base, and this piece doesn't have any flat bases. So I actually split it into two pieces, the bottom round dome thing and the top Lego connector part. And with them printed in two pieces, I have uh, some Gorilla Gel glue to attach them together. Uh, I find this stuff works really well on 3D prints. You just, you just squeeze it out, it's a little gel, and it sticks pretty much better than the print layers in most cases. It's so a little bit of, bit of pressure and you got a completed piece D, starting in two parts. Another piece that had to be joined in two parts was the lever, because that didn't really have a flat base either. So we have the, the handle part, and the part that connects to the Lego, and then on top there is a little ball they're also going to be glued. And the last bit to be glued are these pieces here that hold the studs. So I made these separate so the bottom of those plates can be the bottom of the print. Otherwise, there'd be this little bit hanging off there. So doing it like this, you could have a nice flat base for the print and just attach this tiny little extra piece. Now we get to the studs. So the studs were an adventure. They are clear and very weirdly shaped. They obviously have a flat bottom, but they have an overhang around the entire outside, which has to be done with support material, which then has to be removed. But being clear, it's very easy to mess up. So there's the overhang in the center that has to be printed kind of in the middle of the air and if that ever catches you end up with these imperfections on a regular print it wouldn't matter because it'd be covered by the top layers but on a clear print you would see these all the way through so you really have to make sure that these first layers are solid and nice looking exactly like this so to do this i actually used support material in the middle of the stud just a little bit to hold up the center and that seemed to give the best results. You can see all the failed attempts on the table there. <laughs> but at this point, all of the printing is done. Um, no other real issues, nothing really complex. Still have the wiring to do, but that was all modeled in, so we shouldn't really have any issues there. And it all fits together nice, and we have a completed mini kit. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for the deep dive into the wiring and the deep dive into the programming.